Hello everybody and welcome back to another video. In today's video we'll be taking a look at the 2024 house elections and I'll be doing another updated uh, map prediction for these elections. It's been a few months since I last did one so um, I thought I would give you guys a brief update. Um, there are going to be some states that are going to change their maps due to redistricting or court cases, the first of which I already have on screen which is Alabama. Um, it's very likely that um, they're going to have to draw another majority black seat which will in that case elect a democrat and so i'm probably 80 to 90 percent sure that they're going to have to end up drawing a seat that will elect a democrat for that reason uh, to the supreme court's ruling on it being a racial gerrymander and so as a result of that i'm going to predict that democrats are going to gain a seat out of alabama just because that court ruling um we're going to go over to alaska now kind of begin to take a look at the normal seats that have not uh, been changed alaska that is a seat that democrats won in 2022 by 10% with the ranked choice voting factored in. Um, Mary Poltola had a 48%. She was at 48% of the vote without RCV, so she's still pretty clearly favored by at least the strong plurality of the electorate. I think she will likely win by four to five points next year. Could be a little less because I think Trump will get more Republican turnout. But again, Alaska is a left-running state, and I think Peltola um, is a very strong incumbent for Democrats. Arizona. Have some interesting seats here. I expect Republicans to hold on to the second district. It's a seat that in 20, um, 20 Trump won by eight uh, by eight percent, and obviously in twenty twenty two was a pretty similar margin. So that I would expect to stay Republican by a pretty similar amount. Now the first and sixth are really interesting. I would say the sixth probably stays red very narrowly. I know a lot of people really think Democrats are going to flip it, but uh, in twenty twenty two, Mark Kelly won the seat by like eight or nine points, and. Juan Siscomani won as a Republican. Now, obviously, Democrats did not invest in Kirsten Engel's campaign. I think that was a pretty serious blunder on their part. But Siscomani is now the incumbent. That will benefit him. I think Republicans are going to invest in, you know, trying to hold on to his seat. And um, I don't think Joe Biden's going to win statewide by as much as Mark Kelly did in 2022. So for that reason, we'll be putting it in the uh, tilt Republican column. Now, the first district, though, I think that one could be a bit of a problem for the GOP. I'm going to put it in the tilt Democratic column. Um, it was actually even closer. Jevin Hodge came within, you know, 3,200 votes of beating out David Schweikert here. So I would say this is a very narrow Democratic victory. Um, very left-trending seat, uh, more so than even the 6th district, which is also pretty concerning for Republicans long-term. And I think Biden's going to do really well in the suburbs, just especially against Trump. Arkansas, nothing going on there. California, though, as always, California has a lot of competitive seats. We'll go in order here. I think the 3rd District, which was actually pretty decent showing for them in 2022, with Kevin Kiley winning by 7 in a Trump plus 2 seat. That one, I'm going to say, is in the lean Republican column. Now, this seat is interesting because it's left trending, and Kevin Kiley, you know, he outperformed Trump in 2022, but he ran in a year where Republicans did really well statewide, and he had um, the coattails of Brian Dolly. And so I would say this seat is definitely a toss-up in a uh, you know Trump midterm in 2026 if Trump were to win. If Biden won, Kevin Kiley would probably still be a narrow favorite. Um, but this year, I'm going to say this isn't a lean R column, but could definitely move to toss-up if Democrats can find a strong candidate. Ninth District, Josh Harder, he won in 2022 by 10%. Despite Gavin Newsom actually losing his district, I think he's in a pretty safe race, if I'm being honest. Um, 13th District, John Duarte. This is probably the flukiest GOP victory in the House of... Uh, last November, John Duarte, again, won by 0.4% in a Biden plus 11 seat. But again, Gavin Newsom lost this district, uh, and obviously Joe Biden might not do too well in the Central Valley in 2024, but I would say the seat likely does flip back to the uh, Democratic Party. Now, to go over to the 22nd district, um, the 21st I'm putting in the safety column. Joe Biden won it by, uh, let's see, it's not even on here. Um, Biden won it by 20 points, so I don't really think it's too concerning for Democrats, but the 22nd, David Valadeo. I think this is the year Democrats can finally beat him. It's going to be close, but he's in a Biden plus 13 district, and you know he won uh, by about three percent against Rudy Salas. But Salas is running again. Democrats have another good candidate who um, is running in the primary against Salas. I think either Salas or the other candidate would do well. Um, and again, when you look at, I always talk about this seat because it's very frustrating for Democrats. It's probably one of their worst showings, but Rudy Salas uh, beat or lost, but he only got 40, like, he got 50k votes. You go to a seat that, you, you know, was uh, anywhere else in California, this seat, the losing party got 88k, 52k, and that was 34%. Like, he got 48% with uh, 50k, this guy got 34% with 52k. And then, just like a Bay Area seat, Democrats, uh, or, of course, Kevin Mullen, or, you know, he, he won a two-way race, 55%, but I'm trying to find, like, a GOP versus Dem race where the Democrat won, like, here, 
Uh, Eric Swalwell in the 14th district, super safe Democratic seat, won with 138K. So super low turnout district in 2022. Had Democrats just had slightly better Hispanic turnout, I think Salas would have won. I think in a presidential year, it's really hard for Valadeo to hold on to seat this Democratic. Now, to go over to the 26th, Julia Brownlee, she will likely win re-election easily. But of course, the 27th, this is a big problem for Democrats. It has been um, a, a problem for them as of late. So Mike Garcia, obviously, he's the Republican incumbent here. He won by 6% in 2022. I'm going to say for now, I'd, I'm not going to make an argument for him losing. He definitely could lose because I think Trump's going to really collapse in areas like this where they're very suburban and very educated, which is like Mike Garcia's district. But for now, he's the incumbent. I'm not going to say he's going to lose just yet. Um, and then I'm going to go with the, my incumbents here in these other seats. Uh, young Kim, I think she wins probably by a good amount. She won in 2022. 20, she won by 14% in a Biden plus two seat. I think she wins by maybe 10 this year. Um, the 45th district with Michelle Steele in 2022, she won by 5%. She did not have that great of a showing, actually, against a pretty mediocre Democratic opponent. I think she's in a tilt Republican race. That one could be a toss-up, though. Um, and then Katie Porter's seat, open seat, we'll put it at lean. But Mike Levin's seat, he won by a decent amount, despite Gavin Newsom losing the district in 2022. He won by 5%. I think he'll be okay. And then these other uh, two seats, Raul Ruiz, he's in a Biden plus... Um, Let's see, what, where's that? Raul Ruiz's seat. He is, if I can find it, looks like I'm not going to be able to find it because, oh, I think he's in the 25th. Yeah, he won by 15 to Biden plus 15 seat. He's actually a pretty good incumbent. I think he's going to win by maybe actually even more. I think he could be in a safe race. And then California won Ken Calvert. This is a really important race. Um, I would say this is the most interesting race in California right now. Um, In 2022, Will Rollins lost to Ken Calvert by four and a half points. And, you know, Ken Calvert, I think it's a bit of an underrated incumbent. A lot of people really don't like him, but I think he's a decent politician. So I think he has a really good chance of holding on, more so than people think. But Will Rollins is running again. Will Rollins outran Gavin Newsom by a lot in this district. This seat was very bad for Democrats at the top of the ticket. And I would say, if you made me guess, if I'm giving Mike Garcia the edge of the 27th, I'm going to give Will Rollins the edge of the 41st. But they're very, very close. Now, to go to Colorado, we have two very interesting seats here. The first I'm going to say is a lean D. The 8th District, uh, Yadira Caraveo won by, you know, a little over half a point in 2022. I think that one's going to stay with the Democrats. She underperformed Biden, so that might be a bit of a problem, but Biden will probably win it by more next time. And the 3rd District, this one is very interesting. Lauren Boebert, um, she only won by like 800 votes in 2022, and Democrats did not invest in her race. Now, that being said, there are things that I think you could be optimistic about if you are a um, Democrat or if, if, if you're a Republican in Colorado. Uh, the Democratic nominee for Governor Jared Polis won this seat. And maybe, you know, Democrats caught Republicans sleeping here in 2022. They won in 2024. Now, that being said, there's a libertarian running, which I think really hurts Bobert. And Will Rollins is raising so much money, or not Will Rollins, um, uh, Adam Frisk, who's running against uh, Lauren Bobert for the Democrats, raising so much money. I think this seat goes blue by just under a point. Connecticut, we have only one interesting race here. Johanna Hayes, she won narrowly in 2022, but. Uh, obviously, that's kind of a midterm thing. I think presidentially, Biden will win by more than Ned Lamont did. And for that reason, I think Democrats win this seat by four or five points. Uh, Delaware should be safe. Florida, this one, again, is more interesting stuff. So the fourth district only voted for Trump by 7% in 2020, and it's actually a pretty left running area. So I think we're going to put that in the likely column. Um, and then to go over here, Corey Mills, seventh district, voted for Trump by six. That probably will stay Republican, but again, may- maybe a little bit left trending. Max Frost in the 10th district. I don't even know why that's within, um, you know, I, I don't really know why they had that. Um, but I, again, that's, that should be safe Democrat as with the, um, yeah, they already have Castor's seat, but I'm kind of perplexed as to why that's on the battleground map when it is a Biden plus 30 seat. Regardless, the 9th district, Darren Soto voted for Biden by 17. He won by seven, but that was in a redder year. Again, Florida was pretty bad for Democrats in 2022, so they're going to pretty much outperform every seat by a lot this time because they just did so poorly last year, kind of like the California Democrats. They just had a really bad year, so um, that helps them. And then you go to um, Anna Polina Luna's seat. I think this is actually the best for Democrats because it's a Trump plus seven district, but she only outperformed him by one. Just, like, again, outperforming a you know, candidate by one isn't a bad thing, but you look at these other outperformances, DeSantis outperformed Trump by 17% statewide, Mills by 10, um, Soto's opponent by 10, uh, Laura Lee by 14, uh, Jared Moskowitz's opponent by 9, and then Maria Villarreal Salazar by 14. So 
The fact that she only outran by one shows I think she's a pretty weak candidate. I'm going to put it in the lean Republican column with Starr, but it could definitely move down to Tulsa. It's, it's a, she's a pretty weak incumbent, if I'm being honest with you. So it's kind of a sleeper flip for Democrats, especially if they do well in Pinellas County come 2024, kind of a more suburban, wealthier area that I think Democrats could cut into. Um, the 15th, Laura Lee, like I said, I think she's a decent incumbent. Trump plus three, she'll probably win by six or seven, if we're being honest here. And then uh, that's going to be uh, fin- finished with Florida. So Georgia's our next state here. Kind of just going to run through this, if we're being honest. I don't want to spend too much time on NEC because these videos can get dragged out really easily. Um, what I will say is that I think Sanford Bishop's going to be fine. This is a turnout seat. Um, the only way Republicans can win is if black turnout really craters. And in 2022, that didn't really happen, so there's no reason for it to happen again. So I think Bishop would win this seat pretty easily. Um, Hawaii, Idaho, nothing going on there. Illinois, we got a few. Um, Sean Caston and Laura Underwood are both in pretty solid seats for Democrats. Caston's in a Biden plus 11 seat. Uh, Laura Underwood is in a Biden plus 12 seat. So we're going to say that those are both going to be Actually, we're just going to put them safe. These are incumbents. Republicans aren't going to waste their time here. And then 17th and 13th. The 13th voted in 2020 for Joe Biden by 11. And actually, Nikki good, um, Nikki Budzinski, who I don't know too much about, she actually outran Biden. So, we're, you know, we'll put her in the likely call. I don't really think she's going to lose. But 17th, this, this is interesting. Eric Sorensen won a Biden state seat by four. Not the greatest incumbent, but I think he's still going to win probably just because it turned out. But again, kind of a sleeper flip if Republicans do well in the Midwest next year. Indiana, same thing with the first district. This is another Biden plus eight type seat where Democrats did fine in 2022. I think Frank Mervon will hold on. Iowa, these uh, three seats, they're all pretty interesting. I'll say the first two are going to be lean Republican because Iowa, Iowa is a state that you'd expect Trump to do well in in 2024. But in 2022, Republicans kind of had a very average year. They did about as well as everyone expected. And Cindy actually lost by a little less than I think was anticipated. So that, I guess, could be a concern for Democrats in Iowa or for Republicans in Iowa, but nevertheless, these are both seats that voted for Trump by 3% and 4%. I think that it will stay uh, red. Cindy Axney's seat, this is a very controversial one, but I think it's going to stay red. Zach Nunn is a decent incumbent. He outran Trump in, a, you know, 2022 against an incumbent Democrat, and Cindy Axney, I'm not sure if she's going to run again. Um, some people want Democrats to run Teresa Greenfield, who I think would be a decent candidate, but regardless, I think this one stays uh, red. Uh, Kansas, there's only one competitive seat there. It's going to stay blue. Um, I, I, I could put that safe, actually, because, again, in 2022, uh, this seat, I don't know why it's not letting me click, but this seat voted for Shreese Davids by 12 and Biden by 4.5. So it's super left trending. It's one of the bluest trending seats in the nation. So I think it's going to stay blue pretty easily. Kentucky, um, there's a court case that might get the 6th District drawn, because right now the 6th District is drawn to um, only to be a Trump plus 11 seat. They might have to redraw it, but I doubt that's going to happen. Louisiana, kind of like Alabama, they're probably going to have to redraw a more Democratic-leaning district. It will likely be Julia Letlow's seat. She's in the 5th District, and obviously her seat right now is very safe for Republicans. She won by 50—I I mean, she, she, won, she, she ran against another Republican, um, but she is in a Trump plus 30 seat that she would likely win by a similar amount, if not a little more, in 2022. And so because of that, I'm just going to say that, you know, she's a good incumbent, but the seat could easily be drawn into a majority black seat that would likely cost her her re-election— so we'll, we'll, you know, we'll put that in the likely D column. In Maine, this is another interesting one. I would definitely say um, Jared Golden likely to win re-election, but obviously we have to look at some factors. So first of all, he won in 2022 a Trump plus six seat by 60% with ranked choice voting. Um, but, you know, this seat isn't amazing for Democrats long term. I think he's going to win again, but it's right trending and Jared Golden to me is one of the incumbents that will eventually go down, even if it's not anytime soon. So just be on the lookout for that, but not really. Um, David Trone's seat, that's an open seat. Maryland 6, he won by, you know, the same amount as Joe Biden. I'll put this in the likely column because he's running for Senate and he's going to lose the primary and he's not going to run for House again. But regardless, we will put that in the likely Democratic column. In the 1st District, this was a seat that was pretty bad for Republicans in 2022. Andy Harris actually underperformed uh uh, Donald Trump, and I think that for that reason we'll put him in the likely call. Maybe he wins by 8 or 9 rather than 15, but regardless, not too much to say there. Michigan, we have some more seats that are going to be very interesting to watch. Um, I would say the 3rd and 8th districts are likely D. Dan Kildee is in the 8th, and he's a very popular incumbent. He won by 10% in 2022. Obviously, Michigan is very good for Democrats this year, kind of like the reverse Florida, where it was very favorable to the incumbent party. Nevertheless, I think Kildee's going to win by you know probably similar amount. 
Third District, Hillary Shulton, she won by 13% in a Biden plus 8 seat. I think she'll win again. Um, now, Alyssa Slotkin is running for U.S. Senate. She's in a uh, Biden plus 0.5 seat, but I think Biden will do better there next time. Nevertheless, no incumbent kind of hurts Democrats, and um, this seat will elect Republicans now and then. So we're going to put it in the tilt D column, but we're going to, you know, keep it in the toss-up range. Um, and then the fourth and the tenth. These are all. These are both reaches for Democrats. Michigan four. Uh, there was a Democratic candidate who I, I think had to get on the ballot as like a write-in for the primary, so he didn't really get any attention from the National Party. Bill Huizenga. This is a Trump plus twelve seat that, or a Trump plus four seat that is pretty left trending. Although he did win by twelve, so he's definitely a solid incumbent. We'll put it in the lean Republican column, but again, like I said, if if Trump really collapses in the suburbs next year. And drag down Republicans with them. I think this is one of the seats that could definitely flip, kind of like the seat in Florida that I talked about briefly. So, kind of a lookout type seat. And then the tenth district, I'm gonna put this in the tilt Republican call. And a lot of people think Democrats are gonna win it back, but Whitmer won the seat by a lot. And if um, Carl Marlinga couldn't win it in 2022, I don't really think he can win in 2024. I don't really think Democrats even have a candidate there. So, we'll say this is a um, narrow Republican hold. Minnesota Angie Craig, I have no problem seeing her winning re-election. She won by set or by five percent in a Biden plus seven seat. No problem there for her. Um, Mississippi, no court cases there. Missouri, Ann Wagner. I mean, th- the only way she would lose is if um, Josh Hawley, because Josh Hawley could lose her district, because Josh Hawley's going to, because you know Josh Hawley's going to underperform at the top of the ticket because he's not a very popular incumbent. He'll still win by a lot, but he's going to underperform, and so that's obviously going to hurt the. Republicans, so maybe that cost them a seat or two in the state legislature. Regardless, I don't think it'll cost Ann Wagner, but we'll put her in the likely column to be safe. But she's still a good incumbent. Um, Montana, this this is a seat I've gone back and forth on. I'm gonna put it in the tilt column. My, my my previous argument was that it's a Trump plus seven seat that Ryan Zinke underperformed in. But or, like again, remember in twenty um, in 2020, right? Like the Democrats would have done well in this like basically the argument that i used to make was that since john tester will be will be winning the seat at the top of the ticket in the senate race because this is again this is a seat that's like eight percent to the left of the state and so since test is going to probably come with he, tester will either win re-election or come within a few points of doing so it'll be a close race he'd win this seat by a couple points so um i would say you know i i used to say that because of the tester coattails democrats will win this seat but again montana's a split ticket type state they really like to split their ticket, so I think maybe this seat will vote for Trump narrowly in the presidential race, test her in the Senate race, and then elect a Republican to the House just because it is a more Republican-leaning seat than average. So for that reason, we're going to put it in the tilt R column. Regardless, it's going to be close. Nebraska, Don Bacon, I think this is where he goes down. I've, I've, I've been very cautious about this, but again, he did not do well in 2022. He only won by 3%. And again, that was not a very good showing for him because Jim Pillen, who ran for governor, won the seat by two. And in previous years, right, like in 2020, he won a Biden plus seven seat by like four. So he outperformed the, the Republican candidate at the top of the ticket by 11. In 2022, he only outperformed by one. And if that happens again, he's definitely going to lose. Now, I think he'll outperform Trump by more than he outperformed Jim Pillen by. Regardless, I'm still going to say that he's an underdog to win, especially because Tony Vargas, who he ran against in 2022, is running again. Tony Vargas is a good candidate, and I think he's going to get more adequate funding from the party um, you know, nationally. And I think for that reason, they're narrow, narrowly going to flip to the Democrats. Now, going over to Nevada, I think these seats are all lean D. I don't really have a feeling for any of them. They're all kind of similar margins. Um, I think Biden's going to do worse in Nevada in 2024 than he did in 2020. Whether he wins it or not, I don't know. But we're just going to say um, that this seat will um, elect Democrats, although very narrowly. New Hampshire, these both these seats are up for election. Some people think Chris Pappas is going to run for Governor, I don't think he will. I think he's going to hold on. He won by 8% in 2022 and a Biden plus 6 seat. I think he's going to be fine. That's the first district. And then I think the second, Ann Custer, she won by 12. I think he's also going to win easily. Um, New Jersey, only one competitive seat there. That is obviously um, Tom Malinowski's seat. Or not Tom Malinowski's former seat. It's now Tom Keene's current seat. I don't know why I said Malinowski. I guess I just haven't gotten used to like, the new um congress but whatever malinowski i don't think he's going to run again but democrats i believe are going to run a mayor of a decently sized town in the district i think um i think his name is joe cinarello seems i mean he follows me on twitter so um obviously I'm not going to endorse him because that's not the point of this channel but um if you do follow me on twitter i will always roof just, just kidding but regardless um tom keen 
this is a seat that I'm actually pretty, like, in all seriousness, I, I feel pretty good about Democrats in this seat. Um, Tom Keene won by three in a seat that he should have probably won by six or seven, if we're being honest here. Again, Joe Biden did not do very well here. Or Joe Biden did very well here, and Democrats did not follow up well in 2022 across New Jersey. The, you know, they had a really bad year in the suburbs in the East Coast in 2022, and I would say that um, with Tom Keene being the incumbent, or being the favorite and only winning by three despite really, really being hyped up to win by more, I think that's a problem for him. I also think that Biden's going to win this district by a lot next year. With Trump on the ballot, that really hurts Republicans. So call me a very slight Democratic favorite believer, I guess, Um the candidate they're running, I, I think, will do well enough just to ride Biden's coattails and win this district back. New Mexico, this is one that I think is going to stay blue. Mostly Hispanic turnout type seat. Gabe Vazquez won by 0.7% in 2022. And that was a lower Hispanic turnout year with um, Mark Ronchetti winning the district at the top of the ticket. I think Biden's going to win the seat by you know a pretty similar amount to how much he won it by in 2020. And thus, incoming Democrat probably wins by a similar amount. New York, this one is a, this, I hate New York right now because they're not, we don't know what their map's going to look like. They're definitely going to have to draw out a few Republican incumbents because they did get a court challenge on it. Regardless of, you know, what that entails, we're just going to kind of go off the fly here. I think obviously um, they're going to win the way the map's going to be drawn. I think um, Joe Morrell is going to win. I think George Santos' opponent's going to win. And that would happen regardless because George Santos is very unpopular right now. And then... When you look at Long Island, I think Democrats could, you know, draw out one of these GOP incumbents. I would say just just be very cautious. We're going to say Nicola Lota's seat, which I think they can draw out. They're going to kind of spike it in with more uh, Queens or the western part of Long uh, of the western part of Long Island, which is more liberal. Because kind of you know, there's different parts. Like Long Island itself is a very weird politic like, political region, but you know, aside from the Hamptons, this you know more eastern part of Long Island is very conservative. And I think that when they draw that in with a more liberal base in the Bronx or in on the Bronx am I talking about in Queens or in the western portion of the uh you know the region I think that's going to be enough to beat La Loda this is a Biden plus 0.2 seat from 2020 uh so you know who knows but I think Republicans are going to hold on to the um second district Anthony Gar or Andrew Garbarino he won by 21 so he'll be fine um and then Anthony Esposito I think it gets drawn out as well but maybe it's closer I don't know who's. I, I really don't know what's going to happen in Nicole Maliotaki's seat. I'm going to say that's going to be tilt Republicans. Because I don't know if Democrats are going to have to, you know, actually draw her out. Because again, when you draw dr- districts, you have to make a pack, and I think they're going to pack um, Andrew Garbarino into a super safe Republican district down at the bottom of Long Island, like kind of taking in all the conservative areas so they can't vote in other districts, and then drawing in more Democratic district on the top of Long Island or on the northern part of the uh, Long Island. But who knows? I I I don't know if, if they're going to be able to draw out. The Republican from Staten Island, who represents Staten Island plus a little bit of, um, you know, the real. I don't. I'm being a hater here, but I don't consider Staten Island to be part of New York City. It's not, you know, <laughs> really a place that I associate with New York City. As someone who's been, you know, has like has a pretty um, decent understanding of New York City, I wouldn't associate it as part of New York City, regardless. But, um, you know, unfortunately, the New York redistricting commission or commission in quotes. Um, I don't really think they care too much about what my definition of New York City is. Either way, um, to return to the topic here, I'm going to say that they're not going to draw Molly Otakis out. She's in a um, seat that I think is just Republican enough where they're not going to risk it. But I think upstate Democrats are going to be fine. I think all these seats are going to be lean D just because the way they're going to draw them to be more Democratic. You look at um, Mike Lawler's seat. He won by 0.6 in a Biden plus 10 seat. I think he'd lose no matter what, but I think they're going to draw a seat to maybe you know two or three points bluer. Um, Pat Ryan, I think, will likely um, win again because he won in 2022, so that should be solid for Democrats. In the 19th and 22nd, these are seats where Democrats nearly lost, but their candidates outperformed Kathy Hochul by a good amount. And again, Democrats can just redraw these seats to be, to get more um, you know, progressive and more liberal, and thus I think that they're going to be solid for Democrats. So mostly redistricting stuff there. North Carolina is very similar. Republicans are going to benefit from this. I think Jeff Jackson gets drawn out, and I think— um, they also potentially draw out Valerie Fushi, but I'm just, you know, we're just guessing here. I also think that Wiley Nickel definitely gets drawn out. He's only in a Biden plus two seats. They can definitely afford to draw him out, but these other seats, I think are going to be pretty solid. The Democrats, some of them are very protected. So I think that's going to be enough, but we're just guessing here. Um, and then to go over to North Dakota, that is obviously safe for Republicans, Ohio. We might see some more changes. I think Copter is going to win again, probably by six or seven, maybe by a little less, but still by a good amount. I think. Amelia Sykes will win. 
probably by four or five, if I had to guess. She won in 2022 by five, but Tim Ryan also did well in the district. I think Biden might actually do a little worse than Tim Ryan in this district because it is a little right trending. Um, what I will say is that I would expect uh, Democrats to um, carry her seat along with the first Greg Landsman. This is a Biden plus nine seat from 2020. Uh, I think Greg Landsman will likely carry it again. He won in 2022, and I think he'll have no problem doing so again. Now, I just want to talk about one more seat here. Um, Ohio 7, it was 9%. But, you know, you go to Ohio 15 with Mike Carey. Um, this seat was actually pretty close. And also, Mike Turner in the 10th district was also in a close race. Yeah, that's what I was thinking of. Mike Turner, I think both these seats could be likely for Republicans because these are both seats that Trump won by mid-single digits. And, you know, maybe maybe Biden comes within two points of winning Mike Turner's seat. This is where Dayton is, so... If Democrats have a good year in downstate Ohio, which is always possible, maybe the seat gets competitive. I don't know. We're just kind of guessing here because it's too early. Um, Oklahoma is going to be safe for Republicans. Oregon, um, these two seats are going to be likely for Democrats. Again, the sixth and fourth were close in 2022 because Tina Kotek did really bad, you know, really not a good chunk at the top of the ticket. But um, Democrats held on to them. Val, uh, Val Hoyle won by seven. She'll be fine. Uh, and Andrea Salinas won by three. That was pretty close, but I think she'll also be fine. Now, Oregon 5 is really weird. It's it's one of the worst seats. I really don't like the way they drew this district because they took the more progressive areas down here. Like, Bend itself is pretty progressive. And then they drew it in with, like, more, like, liberal suburbs kind of up uh, near Clackamas County. And what you have is a district that will maybe elect a Democrat next year. But in the primary or in the just the ideologies of the two areas, the Democrats in Clackamas are going to be wealthy and they're going to be very, very moderately liberal. Whereas Bend is more of a progressive kind of younger area that's going to probably prefer a progressive Democrat to be the nominee. Either way, I think uh, Lori chavez Duran is going to narrowly win re-election. Uh, and, and I say that because this is kind of a hot take, but she won by two. And Democrats, you know, Jamie McLeod Skinner got triaged, but uh, Lori chavez Duran is a good incumbent. And I would, like, genuinely, I just think this is one of those seats where Republicans get lucky because I don't think Joe Biden's going to do a maze. Because, again, Biden, I think, will do very well in the northern part of the seat, like in the Portland suburbs, which are, again, wealthier, more neoliberal, more, you know, pro-Biden. But Democrats are going to struggle in areas like Bend where they need turnout. And I think that's going to be enough to get enough of a ticket split to re-elect Lori chavez Duramer. Now, the hot take, I know, Oregon's fifth. It's, it's mostly because I just hate the district. Like, whoever drew that district really, you know, obviously it's for political. It's a gerrymandered district, but it's it's a very, very strange seat to draw. Regardless, though, uh, go to Pennsylvania. Now, I want to talk about the first lot because this is a really weird situation, but the 10th will likely stay with Scott Perry, but could be closer. In 2022, he only won by 7 or by 8%, which isn't that impressive. Again, you know, he did outrun Dr. Oz and Doug Mastriano, but really not too impressive on its own to outrun them. I would argue that most people could, especially as an incumbent. And then I also think Republicans are going to be pretty, like, competitive in the 8th and 7th districts. I think they're underdogs in both. Again, these voted blue in 2022 but not by a ton. Wild won by two, and um, Cartwright won by two and a half. So, you know, we'll keep them in lean D, but I think Cartwright maybe could be a sleeper flip. But again, he's the incumbent, and he won in 2022, so who knows. On the 17th, I think the seat is also going to stay blue by five or six points. Um, Chris Delugia won by seven in 2022. He outran Joe Biden. Obviously, he had Fetterman on the ballot, who did very well here too, but, you know, ha having the incumbency boost doesn't hurt. Now, the first, this is a really, really weird seat. Um, because it's a Biden seat that, you know, will always be Democratic presidentially, but Brian Fitzpatrick always wins by 10. So he's a very good incumbent. He's kind of like the Don Bacon of the Northeast. He always does very well. The problem is that Republicans are challenging him in the primary. They're running, I, th I think, another candidate because they think Fitzpatrick is too moderate. And, you know, usually these primary challenges wouldn't work, especially if it's like a popular incumbent. But Scott Perry, the, rep the representative from the 10th district, just endorsed uh, Fitzpatrick's fr uh, primary challenger. So if this primary challenger wins. This race goes to lean, borderline, likely D. If Fitzpatrick wins, it's likely Republican. So for now, we're going to keep it in the tilt R column because we don't know who's going to win the primary. I always like to go with the incumbent in these primary situations, but who knows? It's really hard to tell, so we're just going to stick with the tilt R rating. But if this primary goes south for Republicans, they're in a world of trouble in this district. Rhode Island, um, I don't want to say too much here. Alan Fung was their best chance for Republicans, and he uh, lost. You know, He put up a good fight, but he, he still lost by four. I think that's going to stay blue. South Carolina, we might see a redraw, but I, I would guess not. I'll, I'll put Nancy Mace in a likely RC just to be safe, but not really too much to say there. Um, Tennessee, nothing going on there, although I will put Andy Ogles in a likely R race. He only won by, you know, 13, didn't really do that well. 
the Democrats have no candidates at the top of the ticket to do anything here. And I think this will probably narrow up a little bit presidentially, but still won't be enough to flip. Um, Texas, a Rio Grande Valley, I, I think is going to stay the same. Democrats, a lot of people think Democrats are going to do you know well in the 15th. I really think Biden's going to still be, be pretty toxic among Hispanic voters. But regardless, there's not too much to say there. The C voted for Monica De La Cruz by 8% in 2022, and it was a red or electorate, but still, who knows? I think it's going to stay with the GOP. Now, the, tw- the most interesting seat is the 24th, because Beth Van Doyne, um, in 2022, she only won by, you know, 19%, and Republicans were really supposed to win this race by a lot more. This is a pretty gerrymandered district, as you can tell by just the terrible configuration. It's kind of like, I was complaining about Oregon, I also am going to complain about this, like, this is a terrible map. Regardless, we'll put it in the likely R column. I'm going to say that she wins by maybe 10 this time because Democrats are actually trying to challenge her. And I think Hall and Laura being on the ticket will help Democrats in Dallas specifically. Regardless, probably going to stay with Republicans um, just because Utah, we might see a redraw there. We're going to put this in the lean column because, again, um, redraw could get the seat into a more bluer district, uh, but we're not sure yet. Virginia, I think Democrats obviously are going to hold on to Wexton's seat. Biden won it by like 18 in 2020. I think he'll win it by a similar amount in 2024, if not more. Um, seventh Spanberger is going to run. I, I, I don't know if she's running again. I think she might run for governor. I, I don't know if she'll run for house. So we're going to put that in the lean column. If she runs, it'll be likely, but for now, I'll put it in the lean column. But, you know, she won by four and a half in 2022. So she's a good incumbent. Um, and then in Virginia too, Jen Kagan's Democrats don't really have a candidate here, um, which hurts them because again, um, Kagan's won very narrowly in 2022 against a pretty mediocre democratic incumbent. But if Democrats don't have a candidate, who knows? I think this will be a split ticket seat. I think Biden will win it by four or five at the top of the ticket. And I think Kagan's will win by like a point two. So kind of a split decision seat, which will help Republicans in the House. Washington, the eighth, will stay with Democrats. I'm very confident in that. Biden's going to do well there. He won it by seven in 2020. Probably wins it by more this time. And Kim Schreier is a good incumbent. And then um, or I, I think it's Schreier. I think someone told me, I had someone in my video where I said her name. I, I think it's Schreier. Um, so I am hoping I got that right. It's Kim Schreier, but... Thank you for correcting me. And if I, again, I can only, you know, pronounce so many house incumbents names. There's too many to remember. So if I mispronounce someone, feel free to correct me. Um, but Kim Schreier, I think, is in a likely D race. Now, Marie Glusen Comp Perez, this is this is an interesting one. Um, she won by 1% in 2022, um, but that was against a terrible Republican opponent. And with Trump on the ballot, you'd think that a seat like this would be energized to vote Republican again. And here's the problem. The same candidate, Joe Kent, who cost Republicans in 2022, is running again, and he just got endorsed by the um, district GOP. So, you know, he's probably going to win the primary, and I think he's going to, you know, have the back of the backing of Trump. And if he runs against um, Marie Lucen Comp Perez, it'll be the same exact race, only now she's the incumbent. And I think that is enough to get her over the finish line here. I think she wins narrowly again. Wisconsin, we have our final two districts there. Um, I'm going to say... We'll go split decision. I think Wisconsin 3 is a lean D.C. Because, again, they're going to redraw the map. Um, but the first will be still Republican. So, obviously, this map is not ideal. Wisconsin's pretty bad geography for Democrats, so the map's always going to be a bit of a Republican-leaning map compared to how the state's going to vote. But what I will say is that um, in 2022, Democrats only lost the seat by three. Again, they did about as well as Biden did. Um, you know, Brad Pfaff, the Democrat, lost it by four. And Trump won it— or, or, and Biden lost it by five, so maybe Faf runs again. Maybe the Democrats can find another decent candidate, and the seat will likely be redrawn to maybe be a Biden plus one or two seat. I think that's enough to flip it narrowly. And then in the first district, um, Brian Steele, he's a good incumbent. I think it'll be hard to knock down for if you're a Wisconsin Democrat, but here's what I will say. Um, in 2022, Democrats, or in 2023, rather, again, like I, like I mentioned for this um, case, since Democrats flipped the Supreme Court, they can redraw the seat to kind of however they want because they're going to—it's it, already being challenged in court. They're already saying this map is unfair. I think that this seat um, could potentially be redrawn to, a, you know, many possible configurations. What I will say is that I think they're going to draw maybe a very narrow Biden seat. Maybe because, again, right now Trump won the current seat by two. Maybe they'd redraw it to be like a Biden plus one seat. But again, Biden plus one might not be enough to knock off um, Brian Steele because, again, he's a good incumbent. He outperforms, and even if Biden wins the district, I think he's still going to win. So— We'll keep it until Republican call now to be very safe, but um, this is where we're at. So this is our nationwide map here. Um, I expect Democrats to narrowly take the House. You know, not a lock, but I'm, I'm pretty confident in it. I, I don't really see why they wouldn't. They came close in 2022. You look at this map. Um, Democrats really were, you know, they 
were a couple thousand votes away from winning the House last year. You know, they, you look at California, they lost these two seats. They lost this one by like um, 500. They lost or 600. They lost this one by, you know, 3,000. They lost uh, this seat here by, you know, 2,500. They lost Bobert's seat by, you know, 800 or 600 rather. So um, they were really close in a lot of districts. And obviously Republicans came close in, you know, some more too. But in a even slightly bluer environment with, I think, Trump on the ballot hurting Republicans, that really, really could make the difference here. So 2024, I'm going to say Democrats, I'm narrowly going to pick them to win the House as of right now, but things could change. So thank you for watching again. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, leave a like, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and I'll see you all in the next one.